Hello everyone, my name is Sue York and I'd like to welcome you to this session of the Festival of New Omar, which is about building your personal brand and I'll be your chair for today. Ray and I will both be um, delivering portions of this presentation and we'll move in between the two and then hopefully the Q&A at the end will be a bit like a discussion or a conversation that looks after your questions. So why would you think about building a personal brand? The chances are, if you've signed up for this webinar, on at least some level, you think there might be some benefits in building a personal brand. But I'd like to talk about some of the benefits because there might be some that you've not even thought of. Having a strong brand can enhance your reputation and it can help you become known as a thought leader or an opinion leader. Having a strong brand can also give you opportunities to showcase your expertise, show the world that you've got specialist skills in a particular area. A strong personal brand can also add to your company's brand, but we'll talk about this a little more later. There can be a delicate balancing act between your company's brand and your personal brand. And just managing those two sometimes can take a little bit of thought and perhaps a little bit of care to see what's the best way of working with that. Many people think that if they have a strong personal brand, it brings them opportunities. You know, it can be good for your career, it can be really good when you're looking for a job or engaged in some sort of job search process. Having a strong personal brand can be helpful in picking up consulting gigs. Book writing opportunities might come your way. Certainly speaking at conferences and getting invited and opportunities to present uh, a really common benefit from having a strong personal brand. Some people say they really like the fact that they get to share their personal views and on a perhaps a more social level but this can work professionally as well sometimes introductions can become a bit easier because people know a little bit about you so it's a nice easy way some of the ice is already broken and conversations can tend to start a little bit more naturally and when you think about some of those other things I've been talking about you know speaking consulting opportunities meeting more people some of those things lead to more travel certainly lots of people say they having a strong personal brand has helped them get to you know conferences and visit places that they wouldn't otherwise and actually a lot of the things that we're talking about can be enjoyable meeting people talking about the work you do if you like your work can be a really enjoyable thing so there's really lots of benefits from having a strong personal brand in putting together this presentation um, we've reached out to some of the people in the industry who are, are names that you might know, people who you know we consider have what we call a strong personal brand. And for the purposes of this conversation, I'll kind of refer to them as brand leaders, but uh, you might be able to think of a better name at some point. So I'm just gonna share a few quotes um, that people have suggested um, that they felt were benefits from having a strong personal brand. We can't share all of them with you today because of timing, but over the coming weeks and months, we'll certainly be disseminating some of this information um, so that you get a greater sense of what people have shared with us. So Betty Adamu says that she, um, I'm invited to do things I really enjoy. Melanie Courtright has said, trust is increased, which has made doing my job, whatever it is, much easier. And Tom DeRyke says, client see you as a thought leader, rather than as a salesperson. They want to connect with you instead of the other way around. Now, if you're thinking about developing your personal brand, a really good place to start, not surprisingly for a researcher, you might like to start doing some research. Now, what do I mean by this? Start spending some time in the market research world. Start in the online space. Check out some of the social media use from other researchers. Probably start with something like LinkedIn or Twitter, and then perhaps move on to some other platforms, and then maybe look at some blogs and other areas. Then perhaps start to have a look at some of the, you know, live events or physical events. Have a look at, you know, how people are presenting themselves at conferences. And what you really should be looking for, and in, for many people, I think social media or the online world is going to be an obvious place to start this research is look at what people are doing. Have a look at their behaviour. You know, what sort of platforms are they using? Are you seeing that somebody's very active on LinkedIn but doesn't spend much time on Twitter? 
is somebody really quite out there on Facebook, but you notice they don't perhaps use LinkedIn. And then have a look at what they're doing, what they're saying. So think about the language they're using. You know, some people build a brand and their social media behavior around really quite a serious presence. Some people like to have a bit more fun. Some people mix it up a bit. Some people, you know, take a very focused and only talk about work. Some people like to mix their social life in a bit. So start to get a bit of a sense of how people are using these platforms, how they're projecting themselves and the sorts of things that they're doing. And then you might start to look at some of the nuances a bit more. Can you see that, you know, somebody talks about research in a very serious way on LinkedIn, but they perhaps have a little bit more fun with it on Facebook. So it's really about starting to get a sense of, you know, what people do, how they say it. And you'll start to, you know, think, well, that works for so-and-so, but perhaps that wouldn't work for me. And you get sort of a sense of how people are using these things. You might find some people who you sort of think, wow, they're doing a great job. And other people you might think, well, I could see, you know, why they're doing that, but I don't think that would work. And you start to get a sense of how you might sort of pull these strands together when you're thinking about your own brand building and the sorts of things that you might do. So I'll now pass over to Ray who will talk through some of the other aspects of this. And the next one is a really important one. So over to you, Ray. Thanks, Sue. And so I'm going to cover one or two practical tips for how you set about creating your personal brand. And the first one is to be authentic. Um, several reasons for this. The first is that you get found out if you're not authentic. The second is it's really hard work to be somebody you're not. Um, so if you are not massively interested in other people, you will find it hard work to be really interested in other people. If you find it um, hard work to do a lot of reviewing work, then you're not going to be able to do that on a regular basis. If you're uncomfortable with pictures of yourself, then you're not going to find you are suddenly good at doing that. So you need to be authentic. However, that doesn't mean that 100% of you is going to be part of your personal brand. Every Everywhere we go, when we're at work, when we're with our family, when we're with our friends, if we play a sport, when we're with our teammates, we emphasize a different part of the real us. And this is, um, we're talking about developing a personal brand in the work career context. So it will be those genuine aspects of your personality, your aspirations that you want to emphasize and that you want people to recognize because in this world either other people will allocate you characteristics or you can take a hand in shaping those characteristics you will always be pigeonholed somewhere and if you don't develop a personal brand other people will choose which characteristics if you develop a personal brand you can be in tr can be um, to some extent in control of that process but you have to be authentic the next one is consistency because when we say brand we're talking all the way back to when a hot iron was stamped on a wooden barrel or onto the flank of um, cattle in order to identify this is owned by this person it had to be clear it had to be sustainable and that's what we mean by a brand so your brand needs to be consistent you want to be using, for example, the same version of your name. You don't want to be Ray or Raymond in different places. You don't want to be Sue, Susan, Susie in different places because that diminishes the brand. At any one time, you want to try to be using a single image um, in social media and in different places. You want to have a different sort of tone of voice sorry you want a consistent tone of voice in social media and in conferences and meetings and when you're writing articles and in meetings in the office and tasks in the office you don't want to be known as really sympathetic in social media and not at all sympathetic in the office that comes back to authenticity authenticity but also consistency we want to make sure that that is the place however as um, Emerson said 
consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. So if at work they say your name has to be Raymond, you may not be able to change that, but actually don't go with that as your consistent image. If you have an image um, at work for the security badge that's used on the website that is really horrible and you hate it, don't put that into your consistent image. If something comes along that you can't change, but you don't want to be part of your authentic, consistent image, don't include it. Just remember, but you're looking to be as consistent as makes sense across different places. And if you are using, say, Facebook for non-career stuff and LinkedIn and Twitter for career related stuff, then you actually do want a different image on Facebook because that helps say today, this is me. This is what I want you to be thinking. Which brings me to the issue of profiles. We're going to be talking in a moment about Twitter and LinkedIn. Make sure that every platform you're using, you have filled in the profile to say the sort of things you want it to say. Now, that might be um, how people can contact you in other social media, how they can contact you um, at work if you want them to. Some people put their phone number everywhere, other people hide it because you are choosing what is going to be in the profile. People do normally expect to know where you are geographically when you are at your workplace. So are you based in Australia? Are you based in the UK? Um, a little bit about your employment, who you've worked for, who you used to work for are really important. And having a statement. So Sue there has got helping create the future of research. Um, I have got there at the intersection of work, fun and discovery. Just a little concept of something which describes how you see yourself, which is consistent with your images and works across the different places that you're going to engage. So we're talking about online and we're talking about offline. Both of these are really important. Online is probably where you're going to start first in many ways in terms of creating a consistent image uh, for your career personality. And the two most important are LinkedIn and Twitter. At the moment, LinkedIn is probably a lot more important than Twitter, and we'll come to both of those in a moment. Um, but they are stand out as the most important. There are lots of other forms of social media. So some people focus on YouTube. Some focus um, on Tumblr, which is the T up there. Some use Google Plus. Some are using Facebook for work related stuff. Um, my daughter runs a laundry business and she does a lot of live video, live feed stuff via Facebook because that works for her audience. Many market researchers don't use Facebook extensively, but some do, particularly um, groups out there such as Women in Research and Hell Yes Research Rocks and groups like that. So you might want to check those out. So coming back to LinkedIn, for a long time, we didn't really know what LinkedIn was for. People collected connections but it didn't go anywhere. And then groups became the main place where things were happening. But these days, it's the discussions around status updates. So if you want to develop a personality, you want to develop um, a set of connections in LinkedIn, the best starting point is to have a look, start following some people because you don't require them to accept you if you want to follow them. Then you start making connections with people you know and people that you want to do business with, people that you want to be connected with. And then have a look at their status updates. This will come up in the feed. And if they've said something that you agree with, click like. Once you get a bit comfortable with that and you start to see what the conversation is, you might start adding in comments like me too or great point JD um, or Annie, absolutely right again. You might share stuff that they've shared. You might also add an additional example. Somebody says, well, I saw this, this and this. You say, absolutely right. And I saw this one over here too. 
once you start doing that, then you're going to be finding your voice, something I'm talking about in a moment, and you will start putting your own status updates. That is the best way at the moment in LinkedIn of finding out what other people think, finding out what they think about what you think, and of making those connections. Now, if you're going to use Twitter, and I use Twitter a lot, um, you want to be using something like Hootsuite, or in my case, TweetDeck, so that it doesn't take over your life. It's a fantastic source of information about the industry what conferences are happening, what articles have been published, what are other people reading. Um, and what I do in TweetDeck is I've got about 12 columns. You can see a few of them here on the screen. Um, I'm following the MRS live feed. I'm following anybody that tweets about new, with new MR in their tweet or with MRX in their tweet. I'm following what is Sue saying. Um, I'm following what people are saying about me. You should always monitor what people are saying about you because they expect you to reply if they mention you in a tweet. So you really want to be monitoring that so that if somebody does mention you, you can do the courtesy of replying to them. If you set your Twitter up this way, then you could go in maybe eight times a day for two to three minutes, see what's happening, reply to a couple of things, and you control the level of involvement. And again, we're looking to see what other people are saying. We're looking to pick up a style. We're going to click like and reshare, retweet, much more than we're going to make comments and post original material because it's not all about talking. Um, I'm very fond of that old saying, you've got two ears and one mouth, use them in that ratio. So liking and sharing are probably more important than tweeting. Commenting is more important than writing new articles. Um, following people is a way of creating filters so that you hear things that might be interesting. There are some people who generate um, the right amount of good, interesting material. There are other people like Guy Kawasaki who generates too much interesting material, so you might not follow that person. Um, one of the things that you will need to do if you're using Twitter is block all of those um, really noisy research companies that just spam the hell out of the new MR or the MRX tag. And that's really easy in something like TweetDeck. There's a, with you go to the ellipses, the three buttons, and you can just block them. They won't appear in your channel anymore. And then you will see more good news as a ratio of all the news that is coming through your scene. This is, of course, true online and offline. Um, so, if you are attending a meeting or attending a conference, adding a comment in, a supportive comment or a friendly question, um, you don't want to be known as the person who adds the negative questions or the problematic questions. Um, you might do it occasionally when it's needed, but generally you want to be known as somebody who is listening and is building and who uses not but, da da da, but and da, 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 to take the conversation forward. As you start to join in, you will find your voice. Now, this is something we often talk about when we're talking about authors or people who write a lot of articles, but actually it's true of your whole um, way of doing business, particularly in social media. So it's why I would start with um, clicking the like button and then in LinkedIn adding a short comment because are you the sort of person that is going to be using a lot of emojis or are you really buttoned down and when you say something you find that you absolutely have to put the link to the source that you're using. Um, are you somebody that will be all lowercase are you worried about spelling? I was talking to uh, one of the thought leaders globally is Dave McCorkin, based in Thailand at the moment, and he doesn't do a lot of punctuation. He doesn't check his spelling. He believes it's all about talking. It comes from an advertising background. That is his voice. Your voice is something that you will evolve by listening to, but also 
by looking at how you are interpreted by others. If you are consistently misinterpreted, then you will want to modify your voice to make it clearer for this audience. And this is the point that uh, Sue mentioned earlier and that our sort of group of experts, our thought leaders have mentioned. You want to align yourself with your business. You really, if you're an employee, I'll come back to being an employer at the moment, if you're an employee, then you really can't be doing things that do not fit. You do not want to be bigger than your organization. You do not want to be embarrassing your organization, but you still have to find your voice and you have to be authentic and you have to be consistent. There are things to think about as you develop your voice. Um, if you're an employer, this is still true. You do not want to be embarrassed your employees. You do not want to be damaging your relationship with customers. You do not want to be damaging the share price and all of those we have seen from time to time. So think about what the social media and the brand personality of your company is and then make sure that yours fits with it. It's not going to be the same but it should be complementary. So I'm going to hand back to Sue. Thank you, Ray. So as it's mostly a researcher audience, I'm sure some of you will be thinking about, well, if I start doing this, how will I know if I've been successful? How will I go about measuring my success? And your ideas will certainly develop and evolve over time in this area. But I think the first piece of advice is like, don't overthink it, but there are different types of success. You know, for those of you who think about, you know, work and building a brand in a very structured way, you might even be thinking sort of KPIs, you know, do I have to have a certain amount of followers? Do I want people to be retweeting my content? And I think we would very much recommend in the early stages not to overly focus on that, but maybe you would think of some KPIs about your the effort that you're putting in. You know, I want to make sure I'm doing something, you know, every single day. And certainly, I think almost anybody who's successful in this area actually have put a sustained period of effort in it. These things don't just happen overnight. So you might think about KPIs and you might think about some metrics around that. And, you know, those might evolve over time. But there might be some other sorts of things you think about. You know, you might think about, is this helping my business? You know, am I being invited to speak at things? Are perhaps new clients seeking me out? Are people wanting to have a conversations? Am I meeting people who want to collaborate with me? So have a think about what, how it might help your business and the sorts of things that would mean success. And then there are some other things that you might think are perhaps a little bit more frivolous, but they can be quite important. Um, you know, is it helping you socially? And that might be, you know, work socially. It actually is really nice to be able to go to a conference where perhaps you're expecting not to know that many people and realize that, oh, actually, I do know a few people because of some of my social media activities. And it can actually be a great icebreaker. And at the end of the day, it's really good if you enjoy this, these things, because if you enjoy doing them, you actually will do them. It's going to be much easier to, you know, spend some time on LinkedIn, commenting on people's status updates, perhaps sharing some, you know, online um, resources that you found. If you enjoy doing that, you will keep doing it day after day after day. So don't discount the benefit of actually finding things that you enjoy. Because as Ray mentioned before, there's lots of different platforms, there's lots of different things you can do. Find the stuff that you like because you'll be more successful at that. Some people um, spend a lot of time across a whole lot of platforms. You'll see some people just find, you know, I do this sort of work, you know, my business specializes in making infographics perhaps you're better off working in some of the more visual social media things. You might find something like Instagram is great, whereas other people who are perhaps sharing more traditional content might find some of the other platforms meet their needs. So have a think about those sorts of things. And if you enjoy them, they'll certainly be more successful. So we also asked our brand leaders to share some other ideas and you know, we sometimes hear negative things about, you know, people 
on social media and your know, things that have happened to them. So we asked our leaders to share some warnings. And Kristen Luck gave some advice that echoes some of Ray's comments earlier. Be cautious about your personal brand overtaking your company brand. JD Deach said, you should never be afraid to say provocative things if you believe them, but you should be careful of how you say them. And Finn Robin said, be appropriately diplomatic. Sometimes you do need to be blunt, but sometimes you don't. And finally, we asked our brand leaders to share some tips to help people out. And Annie Pettit suggests that you figure out who you are. Don't try to copy what other people are doing or how they are doing it, or try to be everything to everyone. Peter Harris said, not everyone is going to love you. Try and be as consistent as possible. And Tom DeRyke said, be patient, be consistent, be authentic, be original, be humble. Post frequently online and get on stage regularly. So this takes us to a little project that Ray and I have been working on, which is developing a boot camp to help people develop their personal brand. So what we're putting together is a six week boot camp. Now it starts on the 18th of April and runs every Wednesday through till the 23rd of May. It's going to be a distance learning type boot camp, so you don't have to get up early in the morning and go down the park and we'll be running it on a webinar platform. So you'll be listening in in a similar way as you are tonight. We've got weekly sessions, each of those run for an hour and there'll be 30 minutes of tuition followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. So lots of time to interact and ask questions. We'll be running the sessions twice a week on a Wednesday at 10 a.m. London time and 4 p.m. New York time. Now you are welcome to pick one of those sessions and stick to it. If your schedule means you'd like to move between the 10 o'clock session some weeks and the 4 p.m. session other weeks, that's fine. If you wanna turn up to two sessions a week, recognizing that'll be a, a mostly a repeat, but obviously some of the Q&A will be different, you'd be very welcome to do that. And as we always do, we'll be recording those sessions. We would hope you could come every week, but we know that schedules, travel, work, sometimes get in the way. So we'll be recording those so you can catch up if you need to. And a big part of the boot camp is going to be setting some weekly tasks and activities. So we'll be kind of giving you some homework, some things to do between weeks so that you can go away. And the idea is that you're building your brand week by week. So by the time we get to the end of the six weeks, you're really well on your way to building a strong personal brand. And whilst we will be conducting the course online and we will certainly be talking about a lot of online activities, we won't be ignoring the offline world. So we'll be talking about you know things you do out there in the real world away from the internet potentially. So there's much more information about this um, on the new MR website and certainly we will be putting some more information in the newsletters. If you're um, active on social media that you'll know, we've put, even put a few blog posts and things and some tips out there already. So you might like to follow those up. And there's certainly links that you can register in these slides when you download them, but um, there's also will be on the website and in the newsletter and things like that. So that's something that we're doing in April. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be very happy to answer them but um, we hope you might think about joining us for that. So we're now about to move over to the Q&A portion of this session. Please, if you have a question, don't be shy about asking. Head over to Twitter, type your question in and just pop hash new MR at the end so we can spot that or go to the question box and type that question in. So please feel free to ask questions. So here's one, Ray, you might like to um, think about this one. There have always been consultants in the market research industry. It's clear why as a consultant, you would want to build a personal brand. What is less clear is why you build a brand when you're employed, job security, question mark, make it easier to move jobs, anything else? Um, thanks, great question. And I first noticed 
that um, the benefit of this a few years ago, ooh, quite a long years, a few years ago, um, I was chairing a session at the MRS conference and we had four young new speakers come along who did a Pachacha session or a Pachacucha, depending on your pronunciation, session. And they did really well and they were very new in the industry. Every one of those then saw an accelerated promotion. Um, three of them are now running companies overseas. So that, that was the first sort of notice of what was going on there. And if you think about just being inside a company, your boss is going to give you jobs to do. Now, your boss normally doesn't deliberately give you jobs that you are not suited to or that you don't want to do. Normally, your boss, when given a choice, she or he will give you the jobs that match your aptitudes. But for that to happen, your boss needs to know what your aptitudes are. What are you interested in? What are the sort of things you want to develop? That actually is part of your personal brand. Um, you want clients, your business, their, your employer's clients to say, oh, can we have John or Sally working on this project. They worked on it last time. They did a good job. And I really like that thing that they were doing, uh, that blog post they wrote or that thing they wrote in your internal newsletter. So it's going to increase your salience in your existing employment. And it's going to make life much easier when you are applying for jobs elsewhere because you're already going to be a known entity if you have developed a positive brand image um, around that. So I would say that yes, obviously for consultants, but actually for everybody, either somebody else is going to pigeonhole you in your work environment or you are going to help shape that pigeonhole. And I think that's why it's worth doing. Aris, the I'll just chip in a little bit extra there. There used to be a saying, and I'm not sure anyone would say it anymore, don't dress for your current job, dress for the job you want next. And I always interpreted that as sort of signalling where you would like to go and making yourself be seen as somebody who could do, you know, like the next job and the next job. And it's a little bit different, but in some ways, if you start building a brand, you're telling other people in either your organisation or other organisations where you might like to be next. So if you're interested in a business development role, for example, you might start to, you know, create the idea that you have some expertise and interest in this area. If you're perhaps wanting to move into, you know, working more in qualitative rather than a, perhaps if you had a generalist role, you might be signaling to people that this is what I'm interested in, if you're interested in technology. So it's a way of actually sending some clues out about what you want to do next. And presumably, you know, those things are the things that you're enjoying. So here's a fabulous question. Ray, you're going to like this. Do you think you can build a personal brand if you are not thrilled about speaking in public? Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a caveat, which is if you want to really move your career forward, then you need, to, it's best to be able to. A lot of people who speak in public are not thrilled by it. Now, I love it. Um, Tom DeWright loves it. Um, but that's not true of everybody. But you want to make sure that when you are in a meeting at work, when you are in a client meeting, um, when you are on a stage somewhere, you are able to do it. But it is only one aspect of the personal brand. As I was saying before, the most important thing is that you are signaling to other people, these are the things that I am interested in. I am knowledgeable about these things. I am skilled about these things. Um, I would like you to give me tasks or to give me employment or to buy projects from me that relate to these things. So it is doing all of those. Um, it is also saying, um, here are some things I'm interested in. So if you want to talk to me, this is what you should come and talk to me about. Because one of the very common themes amongst people who, are, who have a strong social media profile is they're actually quite introverted when it comes to meeting people. 
And if you are introverted, instead of having to go up to somebody at a meeting and say, hi, I'm Ray, I'm from Nottingham, I'd like to talk to you about something, people come up to you and say, oh, I really liked what you said in that question. Um, and I would say that asking a question to, at a meeting is a, is a good starting point rather than expecting to speak at the meeting move your way forward. Um, so yes, developing a personal brand makes sense, even if you're not thrilled about speaking at conferences and large meetings. And it certainly, I think, in some ways can make life a little bit easier if you are shy and I'm, you don't necessarily have to be speaking at a conference, but even sometimes, you know, going to a conference or a course where you don't know many people, just being able to say to somebody, oh, I follow you on Twitter or, or I like what you you know said on, on this topic. It actually just gives you some, you know, like nice and more natural things to talk about than, you know, discussing, you know, sort of topics that you, you know, are not really that interested in. You don't know whether the other person's interested. It can just be a nice sort of icebreaker or the ice has already been broken elsewhere. Um, here's one on LinkedIn. And this is actually um, something that people talk about from time to time. And it's what's considered overkill on LinkedIn. People have commented, you must not be very busy at work as a result of high activity on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, I'll start off on that one and I'll let you chip in, Ray. I mean, obviously, if you do spend a lot of time during business hours, you can see why people would ask those questions. But um, after hours social media use, um, depending on you know what you like to do after hours, can be useful and it also, you know, think of it as something you can perhaps you do in some of your downtime, you know, like time between meetings, you're waiting for something to happen. I mean, a lot of people um, use commuting time to fill in the gaps on that. Thanks, Sue. I mean, I, I would probably disagree very slightly in that LinkedIn work should mostly be done when other people are working. Um, if you have a look at LinkedIn on a Saturday and a Sunday, you will find that there are a whole bunch of people who who like doing it then, and, and that's fine. But if it's really about developing your um, your persona and your brand in the business space, then I think as much as reasonable should be in that uh, work time slot. Of course, you're probably also thinking globally, so that work time slot is somewhat larger um, because of We've got the Asia countries, then Europe, and then the Americas. Now, too much. If people start complaining in significant numbers, that was too much. That's why listening is and reading is so important. If people stop responding to what you're doing, that is too important, um, too much. I'm not sure that there is a perfect answer, but if nobody thinks you're doing it too much, then you're not doing it enough. Um, in this world, you are going to offend one or two people. As Peter Harris said, not everybody is going to love you. Um, I have got you know, a strong image. Um, quite a lot of people like what I write. And when I read the comments afterwards, it goes nice thing, nice thing, nice thing, nice thing. Oh, Ray, he is such a dot, dot, dot. And unfortunately, they don't even put dot, dot, dot. They put words. Um, that is going to happen. You cannot create a, a strong impression without some people realizing that they don't like your brand. If you've got a brand, some people will not like it. And you need to be aware of that. Now, if you find that quite a lot of people, like 10% of people don't like it, then you need to tone it back. You are being in some way unpleasant um, or discordant or misunderstood. Yes, probably that's it. You're being misunderstood. Um, my own pet hates are people who post the same comment in eight or nine groups. But that's only going to offend people who are a member of eight or nine groups. People who are only a member of one group won't see it as a problem at all because they're we're going to see what you've done once. Um, I think if you are posting a similar thing, it's nice if you tweak the wording and you match it to what people do. And you should be replying and liking much more than you are doing stuff. So I'd come back to that point that I made earlier about the balance. 
And I think that touches on the fact that online, it's called social media. And if you think about normal social settings, how would you have a conversation? You know, it's expected to be, you know, kind of a two-way street, a three-way street, a four-way street. You don't often stand somewhere yelling what you want to say and not listening to what other people are saying. So, you know, think of some of the the rules of, of normal social behaviour and apply those. Um, we've got some other questions here. Um, and we've got one about whether you should keep your personal brand separate to the companies you work for. Why and how? I think that probably touches on some of the balance issues, but goes to a slightly different place. Um, if you are sensible, then you need to own your personal brand. So in the early days of Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook being used in these ways, there were some companies who sought to own it that when you left, you had to hand over the password and stop using it and so on. Now, there, that is the role for corporate accounts. That's the role for um, brands where you are representing. If you look at Twitter, a lot of the discussions that go out there are from companies like um, Further, they're from organizations like the MRS and SMR. And that is that is fine that's going on there. You should, in, in my opinion, um, I am HO as they say, um, make sure that you own your brand, that when you leave, you are not going to hand over all of those connections. There are some changes in the law coming, like the GDPR, which comes into law um, in May, which is going to make that even more the case because you would not necessarily, getting a bit of feedback, um, you would not necessarily have the legal right to hand over that contact information to your employer. But you don't want to be doing anything that is harmful to your employer, that is clearly antagonistic. And there are often rules about what you do. So, for example, I've done quite a lot of stuff uh, with the police forces in the past. They are not allowed on their personal Facebook profile to show pictures of themselves in uniform. They can have a work profile, which is all about being a police officer, but they can't conflate the two. Um, so you probably want to think about whether in your personal Instagram, your personal Facebook, you would do photographs from the works party um, within that. Okay, and here's one. What would you recommend for this for people who just don't like using social media? A lot of recommendations rely on social platforms, but what if you don't want to use them? And if you must use them, what compromises are there? Well, I'll start with the easy one, which is if you must use them. So LinkedIn. Um, I would have some doubts about giving a fieldwork contract or a software contract or a consultancy project or a teaching role to somebody who did not have a LinkedIn profile unless there was a reason why I already knew. So I, I have done one sequence of projects with somebody who was being stalked by an ex-partner. They didn't have a social media profile. Yeah, that's very understandable. Um, there are people who come from countries where LinkedIn is not the big platform and they haven't got one. However, I usually suggest that they think about them. So I think that not having a LinkedIn profile, which is different to being active on LinkedIn, um, is, is probably problematic. Then if you're going to um, develop at a minimum, it would be only connecting with people you already know, liking things and you should only like things you like, but you might be a little bit more judicious about that. In terms of then developing a personal brand, you are going to have to work harder at trying to do things like writing articles, speaking at conferences, um, speaking in staff meetings, um, writing the company newsletter, doing those sorts of things. Things, being on the social committee um, at work, being on um, the training courses committee and things like this, all of those 
but it's it's become easier with social media to develop a personal brand because there is something to go back to as as a core unit and a reference unit and it's a place where you get more feedback on whether your personal brand style is being heard and whether it's working and in itself the decision to not use social media or to use social media actually says something about your brand so I think you would really need to think about well if this is my brand or my brand message is it reasonably consistent to not use social media so if you were saying you know wanting to convince people that you're on the cutting edge of new ideas um, you know or had a particular expertise around technology it might not be a good fit not to be active on social media whereas if somebody you know worked as a historian for argument's sake it might be very consistent to not be interested in social media so I think you would probably have to think about you know how that fits you know with the brand image you're trying to project as well um, here's a question Ray I am not sure whether it is a joke or serious but let's go what mark out of 10 would you give brand Ray Pointer I should probably be asking you and the rest of the new MR team um I would probably be quite favorable to uh, my image I spent a lot of time working on it I would probably give it an eight um, what could it be stronger on it could be um, much more image based um, it could probably benefit from a bit more listening and a bit less talking um, would be probably things like that and maybe some of the newer zones I'm a little bit uh, weak in the, the sort of the snapchat -y Instagram sort of areas um, but in general having the personal brand that I've developed because my skill set is comparable to hundreds thousands of other people but people give me the opportunity to travel around the world to speak at conferences when I arrive people already know who I am I'm actually one of those people who finds it very hard to go up to new people and introduce myself and I almost never need to because people come up to me and that makes life a lot easier okay well I guess if people agree or disagree with that they can chip in on social media as to whether they do or not um, here's one um, as you mentioned LinkedIn is not big all around the world with the fact that a lot of Asia uses Facebook for work purposes would you recommend setting up separate Facebook accounts to keep personal and work apart this goes against being authentic but do people want to see lots of family posts and I'll hand over to you in a minute Ray but authentic doesn't necessarily mean you have to put all of your life into your one profile but it means you shouldn't put something in in there that is not you and you probably shouldn't leave out significant work aspects of your profile but um, you know you don't have to put absolutely everything into your work profile and it's certainly something in the early stages that you should really probably have you know a really hard think about before you get started how much of your work profile is work only and how much do I want to bring in um, you know some of my personal aspects and if you go back to that stage we talked about about kind of researching the field you will see that various people handle this differently and I think in many ways it's a bit of a personal decision about you know how much you want to share but you'll certainly see some people that you could look at their profile and you would know that athlons or that they like going on holidays or that they perhaps like you know particular types of food or dining at high-end restaurants and things like that whereas some people you will know very little about their personal life it's very much about research and I think that's sort of a balance that you have to find absolutely um, I use the analogy really of when politicians are caught having an affair and, and cheating on their uh, partner and family they fall into two categories there are politicians who've always taken a relatively non-judgmental stand and they get a little bit of negative coverage 
And then there are politicians who have gone on and on about the family and values and so on, and their hypocrisy, lack of authenticity, normally results in a major, major impact on them. So yes, authenticity doesn't mean saying everything about yourself, but it does mean that you shouldn't say things which are absolutely not true um, and which could cause a problem. Now, there are really three different ways that people handle the Facebook thing. One is you have two profiles, one which is your personal stuff and you don't do any work created stuff on it. Another one where you do it's almost all work and it'll have snippets of your sort of wider personal life. That is one. The second is that you only have a work profile uh, because you don't like social media. You don't have a Facebook profile for your private life. The next one is that you have one which is just about your private life and you don't do any work related stuff on that one. Um, and I would be moderately close to that in terms of my use of Facebook. Um, and then the fourth one is you get some people who are very, who choose to be wide open. And here is, um, here is my family, here is my work related stuff. And here are my crazy right wing American views. Um, and that is fine. But what you do see is, it has some impact on their business relationships. If you have views that are quite right wing, this is probably also true of people views with left wing, but I'm much more forgiving of those. Um, if you quote um, religious texts in your Facebook profile and you connect with lots of work colleagues, you are going to apply a filter to the rest of your life and that may be the choice you want. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. It has an impact and you decide if you want that impact. If the most important thing to you in your business life is that you do proselytize on behalf of your religion, then you should do it. If on the other hand, you don't want to have that as an unintended consequence, don't connect your Facebook world with your employment world. Um, here's one that sort of almost follows on around that, but say if you start a conversation on LinkedIn, do you feel a responsibility to moderate the discussion, particularly if you get some you know, negative comments and things like that? Um, yes, um, in two ways. Uh, yeah, that, is, that is my discussion. It reflects on me. Um, and the way that I might moderate comments would, would range from Mm, not sure I agree with that. Um, through to one recently, somebody I like very much had put um, yawn in, in, the, in a comment and then somebody else had picked up on that and the person who had said, it said oh, I didn't realise it was negative. And I said, well, actually, in lots of places, it is very negative. It may not be where you come from. Um, but other times people will put in something which is offensive and then I edit, remove it. It's my conversation. You don't come into my house and swear. Um, just a quick tip if you're ever invited into my house, we don't swear in my house. Um, and you don't in my conversations, you don't say something that is sexist or racist. Um, and if it's in your conversation and you do that, then I will withdraw from it. So that is my position. Now, that is a little bit like what I was saying a moment ago about the, conf the potential conflict between your principles and your business career. That is going to make me seem stuffy to some people, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> okay, well, we are almost out of time, and we have actually dealt with all the questions. So, um, seems like a very serendipitous time to bring the webinar to a close. Thanks everyone and bye for now.